Got one. Welcome to the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. I'm your host, Tom Rosenbauer. People love to fish for pike and muskie in oh, yeah, many yeah. parts of the USA and Canada, yet few anglers try them on a fly rod, which is hard to believe. Oh, look at that. Catching a large pike or muskie on a fly rod is more fun than you can imagine. They strike aggressively, they jump, they roll, they sometimes take you into your clear, back. These are sea. really great sport fish, especially on a fly rod. In this episode, We'll give you all the basics for fly fishing for pike and muskie. All right. Oh, yeah, nice fish. That fish has already refused that fly. You're going to have to try it just a slightly different pattern. The roll cast pickup is a great cast to use in a lot of fishing situations. This is a beautiful wild trout from a small stream. Just a gorgeous little fish. I say hit that bank. Let's go to that grass bed. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing. Algoma Country. Destination Ontario. Main Office of Tourism. Yellowstone Teton Territory. Crazy Rainbow Ranch. Bahamas Tourism. Adipose Boat Works. Global Rescue. Trout Unlimited. Pike and muskie are a popular sport fish that can be caught throughout Canada, the United States, and Europe. These warm water species are aggressive predators that love to hit lures that resemble bait fish. On a fly rod, they're incredible. From their lightning fast strikes to their explosive fighting abilities, using flies to catch them is a lot of fun. To start, we should learn a little bit about pike and muskie, their seasonal behavior, and what parts of a river or a lake they relate to at different times of the year. Pike are commonly known as northerns, jack, gators, and snakefish. They're directly related to muskellunge, though muskies will usually grow a lot larger than pike. Both muskie and pike are the top predators in any body of water. Usually pike will far out never muskies. This really has to do with their spawning times. Pike spawn right after ice out in shallow water in the spring. Muskie, on the other hand, spawn from two to five weeks later. Thus juvenile pike fry have a time and size advantage in the first year. Pike fry feed heavily on juvenile muskie. This explains why pike normally outnumber muskie in most water systems. Pike and muskie will relate to specific structure depending on the time of year and the type of water system you're fishing. It's always a good idea to obtain a hydrographic map of your local water system, if at all possible. This map will help you locate underwater structure that's key to finding big fish. Here's some general guidelines on where to look for pike and muskie in different seasons. In the spring, shallow bays and large flats adjacent to deep water are good bets. This applies to both lakes and rivers. Post-spawn pike are usually in these areas trying to put on some weight by eating bait fish. As water temperatures increase in the summer, large pike begin to gravitate towards deeper water. However, they still relate to key structure. In lakes, look for weed beds, especially in areas where there are definable points and breaks. These serve as ambush points. Bulrushes, milfoil, and lily pad areas are good places to key in on. Points, underwater saddles between land, and submerged islands are all good places to find pike and muskie. In rivers, look for ambush points where pike can stay out of the current. Slack water adjacent to boulders, riffles, 
and fallen logs are all good locations. In the fall, pike get a little tougher to locate and they tend to be in deeper water. You have to get your flies down fairly deep in the water column when you fish ledges and drop-offs, and any structure really that relates to deeper water. The cooling water really slows down their responses, so slow presentations are usually ideal. Here I am in midsummer, fly fishing for pike on deep water drop-offs using a sink tip line. A slow, steady presentation was the key to success this day. All right. Ooh, it must be a pike. I don't know, it's not fighting like a pike. Yep, it is. Yeah. Oh, there's a pike. There's a pike on a twisty fly. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> you tell me what to do. It's a nice one. Yeah. You know, people think you have to retrieve really, really quickly for a pike, but this pike took the fly on the drop, on a very slow retrieve and then drop and uh, on a sinking line. So it's not always a very, very fast, aggressive retrieve when you're fishing for pike. I'll try to get him to turn around. Whoa! <laughs> There we go. That's a nice pike, huh? Yep. Better than the one right. today. Gone. <laughs> you know, in um, in larger lakes, pike you can find in shallow water in the spring and fall. When it gets towards summer, you have to fish deeper on the drop-offs, 10, uh, 15, even 20, 30 feet of line with a sinking line. That's how we just caught this pike because it's summertime, so you can catch them later on in the season when they're not shallow with a fly. See why it's important to have a weedless fly here. That was deep. That fly was deep on that... And moving, huh? Not moving that fast. Let's see what we got here. It's always fun when it comes up from the depths. You never know what you're going to have. Oh, smaller pike. Even a small pike Hits pulls off. line and gives you a pretty good tussle. They're great fly rod fish. They're aggressive. They're cool looking. They're almost prehistoric looking. Not something you expect to find in fresh water all the time. And then we're gonna need we're gonna need pliers for this one because he's deep. You wanna you wanna nut this one? Be, mm -hmm. Pit tag. This is a younger one. It might not. Yeah, we'll probably it, it probably won't have a tag. All right. Pike are always fun on a fly rod. I joined my friend David Phillip on a lake near Kingston, Ontario, to fly fish for midsummer pike. Dave is a biologist doing research on pike with Queen's University. Through our long-term studies on pike behavior at the Queen's University Biological Station, we've found that pike set up very distinct summer home ranges. That is, they overwinter in a neighboring lake, migrate into this lake for the summer, and go to the same places year after year. So that when we capture pike, we've had this long-term study, when we recapture pike year after year, we capture them in almost the exact same area, usually within a 10 meter radius of where we captured them the year before, maybe five years before that. So there are some places in the lakes and certainly in rivers too that are very good for pike to hang out and ambush prey. And so if you catch a pike in one, uh, one year, probably that will be an excellent spot the next year as well. What brings pike and muskie back to the same location every year is reliable food sources, perch, walleye, minnows, and even frogs and small ducklings are all sources of food for these voracious predators. As fly fishers, we need to match these food sources with appropriate flies. It's the same as with conventional tackle fishing, and it's part of the allure of fishing, finding the right lure or fly for the right conditions. 
Stick baits that imitate bait fish are not that different from fly patterns. They share similar colors and silhouette. What is key for both is presentation. Presentation is always important no matter what species you fish for or what tackle you use. You should be sure that the lure or fly you're using is in the right depth of water and imparts an action that triggers a strike. Large pike and musky flies made of deer hair and feathers are good options when the fish are shallow. Foam poppers are particularly popular in various sizes. Sometimes smaller surface flies are required in shallow water, especially using patterns that imitate frogs or mice. For streamers, Patterns that use rabbit fur are a popular choice, but even better are streamer patterns that use synthetic materials because the flies are easier to cast as they don't hold water. The key with all your patterns is versatility based on conditions. The speed of your retrieve can be critical when searching for active fish. I always like to start with a fairly active or fast retrieve to figure out how aggressive the pike and muskie are. If I don't get any strikes or even any follows, then I dramatically slow down my retrieve and put in a lot more pauses until I find the right combination that works. Experimentation is the key with your retrieves. The retrieve is often more important than the fly pattern you pick. Oh, look at that. In order to have the most versatility for pike and muskie fishing, it's considered ideal to have a range of fly lines. These lines will allow you to fish the entire water column as you search for active pike and muskie. A weight forward floating line will probably be your go-to line in most cases. But in addition, you should have an intermediate line, a sink tip, and sometimes a full sinking line. I like full sinking lines in 250 to 500 grain as they're easy to cast and sink evenly. For equipment, most pike and muskie fly fishers use 8 to 10 weight rods with an eye weight being the most popular. Good quality large arbor reels with solid drags are also a good idea to fight these strong fish effectively. Watch as we use a full sinking line to pull a deceiver pattern into the kill zone for big northern pike. The warmer the temperature, the bigger the kill zone, because their metabolism will be up. Then as the water gets colder, that kill zone gets smaller, meaning you have to put that, the fly, the streamer, or the leech pattern right in front of their face. With our northerns, in the spring, the, the leech pattern is usually our best pattern because it's a high source of protein with little to no gain, like they don't have to go out of their way to go for it. Uh, but as the water temperature gets hotter here, they, their metabolism will increase. They'll start going into the weed beds looking for perch, walleye, and suckers. Okay, oh, he's coming towards the boat. <sighs> Gotta get him on. So what was happening is I was making short casts and working any structure we could see, we're in about two and a half, three feet. I know it's hard to believe. And I just had a walleye take a grab at my fly. Next cast, just a little bit over to the right, and this guy came out and just hammered. Oh, it's a nice looking fish. Look at him. Oh, yeah. I'm going to try and get him in because we're getting into Ready? shallow water. Yep. All right. Okay. 40 inches. Yeah, I'm off. <laughs> All right, let's let him go. As soon as he's ready. Next, we'll learn some casts for pike and muskie, plus special techniques that will help you catch more fish. Hi, I'm Pete Kutzer from the Orvis Fly Fishing Schools. Today, we're going to talk about the double haul and making a quick presentation towards moving fish. There are times when we do have to gain a little bit more line speed. Let's say we're dealing with windy conditions, casting larger flies, maybe a little bit more distance, and that's when the double haul is gonna come in play. Believe it or not, I use the double haul whenever I cast 
say over 30 feet. It actually takes a lot of strain off of our casting hand. Uh, it makes that cast easier uh, when you're dealing with those longer distances. Before you start the double haul, you wanna make sure that you can get that pick up and lay down cast consistently, nice, smooth, tight loops, and your shooting line consistently as well. Once you start to shoot line, then we can think about that double haul. The double haul does require a little bit of coordination. It's kind of like patting your head and rubbing your stomach at the same time. However, it's not as difficult as you might think. We can break it down into its very simple forms, but first we need to understand how this cast works. When we make a basic back cast, we're starting with that forearm, bringing that rod back, then applying that little pop to a stop or that little flick. Then when we come forward, we're doing the same thing just in the opposite direction. Think pop to a stop pop to a stop with a smooth acceleration in between. When I start to haul, the haul actually does the same thing as that flick to a stop. I'm gonna lock out my wrist and just tug on the line and you're gonna notice that that line starts to jump behind me and in front of me. There's one key part though we have to think about with this double haul and that's the reposition. After we tug on this line, we have to drift back to set up for that haul on the forward cast. So we come back, haul and then drift set up, you know, maybe a haul of 18 to 24 inches, then haul and drift on the forward cast. Haul and drift, come forward, haul and drift. We don't have to reach all the way back up here by that guy. This is gonna kinda contort you a little bit, make it a little difficult to get that haul. Just up near the reel, so we're set up for that forward haul here. Haul reposition, haul reposition. When hauling, or when practicing hauling, you're gonna do the same thing. You might make a couple hauls and false cast in between, but then you wanna make that nice haul right down by your pocket, shoot that line, and that's gonna help get that line to roll out. It's a little bit more of an aggressive haul, not too much more, but that's gonna help make that final delivery cast. So we haul reposition, haul reposition, then when I deliver that cast, I'm gonna make that nice haul down by my pocket, remember to feather that line back up underneath that finger, closing that bale, and then we can start to strip that line back in as we're fishing to those fish. Pike and muskie are all business. They're at the top of the food chain and as predators are designed to easily capture prey items using their razor sharp teeth to penetrate the skin of prey. These same sharp teeth will easily cut a regular monofilament tippet, so you'll need to use wire leaders. There are a variety of quality wire leaders on the market, many of which you can tie knots with. Use six to 12 inches of wire leader with your leader system when fly fishing for pike and muskie in order to prevent losing your flies. One of the best ways to locate aggressive pike and muskie is to cast large streamers on top of weed beds. In the early summer, before the weed beds have a chance to fully mature and grow all the way to the top of the water's surface, there's an exceptional time window for fly fishers. That's when there's approximately one or two feet of space between the weed tops and the surface. Anchor near the weed bed edge and cast across the top of this structure, stripping in your streamer. The big pike and muskie, who are hidden in ambush positions, will emerge from the weeds and follow your fly. Usually they'll strike during the retrieve when the fly pauses and flutters, as if hurt. This can be some of the most visually exciting fishing of the season. So we're just carefully working over the weed bed, and that's where the pike are right now. Huh. Uh. Holy mackerel, is that a big fish? Did you see him, John? Oh, I see him. He crushed it, eh? He did. He hoovered it. Oh, it's strong fish. <laughs> we what got we've got is really high winds, and that's what's been causing us a lot of grief, because we know the fish are here. We keep seeing them, but Just get keep, them. <laughs> keep pulling us off top of the weed bed. So I've been using a full sinking line. Oh, look at him. That's a nice fish. Nice fish. Nice thick one. He crushed that, eh, Carl? Oh, he just hammered it. Just he hammered it. We're going to use the net on look, this one because with these wind conditions. Oh, I'll try and get him up. Look at him. Oh, he's not ready yet. Whoa! Oh! oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and I think he splashed the camera a bit. Oh, it's a nice fish. Oh, look at the head on that fish, yeah. eh? There, that's He's going to go again, so we just try to keep yeah, his... I'm going to keep... Yeah, because I don't want to get him too green. Head first. Oh, oh there we go, oh. my friend. Right on. <laughs> wow, look at that northern. Look at the size of 38 inches. That is a killing machine. Holy <laughs> mackerel. And he took it, what, a rod length away? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna put him in the water here, gently. 
Just wait till he's revived a bit. He's ready. He's already starting to kick. There he goes. I don't know what that is, but it's big. <laughs> that must be a pike. <laughs> it's actually taking line. Uh, uh. <laughs> you don't worry. You don't usually like worry about a fish taking line when you're doing this. You got him. Yeah, I got him. Okay, good. Jeez. Whatever he is. Well, I've definitely. Hung. Let me give the thing slack and see what happens. Is he in there? Yeah, it's a big pike. Jeez, he is in there. He is in there. You want me to net that gamong? <laughs> oh, there oh, he is. No, no, he's, he's, no, he's, he's a nice pike. Yeah. 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 Well, let's see what we got here. Oh, a pike. <laughs> There's a pike in there. What do you know? Smart one. There's a pike in all that salad. Nice pike, too. Very nice pike. Yeah. Boom. There he goes. You know, a lot of people uh, angle for pike with bait casting rods, with spin rods. You can catch them on flies, too. Great big streamer flies, poppers sometimes, and they are lots of fun. Pike and muskie are so much fun to catch on a fly rod. Savage strikes, aggressive behavior, and sometimes right next to the boat. If you haven't tried to catch pike and muskie on a fly rod, I strongly encourage you to try it. It's a lot of fun. I hope you've enjoyed learning about pike and muskie fishing on a fly. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing. Algoma Country. Destination Ontario. Main Office of Tourism. Yellowstone Teton Territory. Crazy Rainbow Ranch. Bahamas Tourism. Adipose Boat Works. Global Rescue. Trout Unlimited. <laughs>